Hello everyone and welcome to CRAM Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby we bring you Crumb Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Uh, we are going to have a look at uh, an interesting paper on neoadjuvant treatment uh, in rectal cancer uh, today and Prof Saba is going to talk uh, about limitations of uh, uh, RCTs and biases that can affect them uh, continuing on his previous lecture. I'll leave you to it. So I'm Sean. I work in um, St. James's with um, Gio as one of the regs. Um, I work as a junior clinical fellow um, and we are reviewing the watch and wait after new adjuvant treatment in rectal cancer, a comparison of outcomes in patients without with and without a complete response at first reassessment in the International Watch and Wait database. Um, so this was a recent publication um, in the BJS in 2023, and the link's just there to it. So just on to a bit of background about it. Absolutely. So um, we do know that uh, more and more often we are providing patients with uh, neoadjuvant treatment um, before proceeding to surgery for uh, rectal cancer. And uh, with the evolution of radiotherapy, chemoradiotherapy and chemotherapy, we have now developed a fairly standardized model of um, a total neoadjuvant treatment, uh, whereby patients are given chemoradiation and chemotherapy and then are assessed clinically and radiologically to determine whether they've responded to treatment. And it has become more and more evident, but has been known for many years, that a lot of patients actually respond very well to this treatment to the point where the cancer pretty much disappeared on both MRI and endoscopy. Um, and it has become reasonably established to watch and wait some of those patients to see if this complete clinical response actually persists in time. Uh, a little bit less clear is what to do with the near complete clinical response. Um, and what you can see here uh, represented in, in this chart um, is the OPRA three tire clinical response assessment scheme, which comes from the OPRA um, trial, which kind of contributed to the popularization of TNT. Now, this paper tries to look into what happens to patients that following a variety of uh, different types of neoadjuvant treatments end up having a complete or a near complete clinical response and, and determine what happens to them um, in time. Now, uh, I'll pass the ball back to Sean for uh, a little bit more about uh, the aims of this paper. Perfect. Um, so the aim of this study um, was to compare two different groups of patients. So ones that achieved um, a complete clinical response at first assessment versus ones that um, achieved a complete clinical response at a later assessment from the watch and wait database, which was made in 2014 um, and has kind of retrospective and prospective data that they put on. Um, and they defined a near complete clinical response as on MRI as an MRTRG of two or more um, or a on, on endoscopy. Um, so um, with ulcer or polypoid tissue or stenosis endoscopically. So we just um, put it in PICA. So I'll pass it back to Gio. Yeah. So... Um... Obviously, this is um, an observational data set study, so uh, PICO doesn't necessarily marry very well with this, but we did it anyway. We could say that the patients included here are patients who at some point achieved a complete clinical response after having had some sort of neoadjuvant treatment of a variety of kinds. Uh, the group that we are sort of uh, experimenting on, if you like, or that we are watching in terms of comparing their outcomes compared to what we normally do is people that did not have a complete uh, response on the first reassessment, but were kept on a watch and wait protocol for longer and then achieved that clinical complete response. Um, the comparison, so the standard of care would be patients who achieve a clinical um, complete response at the first reassessment after having had the neoadjuvant treatment. 
Um, the outcome they look at is organ preservation, which basically means um, retaining the rectum uh, without an operation of any kind that would uh, obviously remove it. Um, absence of a local regional regrowth, unless a salvage procedure with a transanal excision is performed, which again means only removing the lump without removing the actual rectum. Um, they also look at other outcomes, such as distant metastasis, uh, free survival, and overall survival. And uh, we'll go into some more details um, about that later. Uh, so, Paul, back to Sean for some methods. Um, so, like Gio touched on, it's an observational study, um, and it collects data from the Watch and Wait database. And so that's a um, international multi-center um, database, database um, using retrospective data. Um, so it included... Um, patients collected from 1991 up until the 1st of April 2022 and it included all patients um, that ended up having a, a complete clinical response whether that was at first assessment or at a later assessment and this was based on both MRI and, endosco and endoscopy um, and sometimes um, they also used TM um, during follow-up as well um, but excluded were those patients who um, were unable or refused to have operative management, so off that first, or um, and then went down the watch and waste because they couldn't or refused to have the operative management. And also patients who didn't have both MRI and endoscopy. Um, and then they just used organ preservation as their main outcome, as um, we put in PICO. So let's pass it back to Jill. Wonderful. So um, as you can see in the data set, they had uh, just above 2000 patients um, after a few exclusions uh, predominantly related to incomplete data or uh, application of exclusion criteria, they end up with about 1000. Uh, 600 um, end up having a complete clinical response to the first reassessment and 400 end up having a complete clinical response at a later reassessment. So 600 versus 400 in total. And uh, uh, ball back to Sean for uh, a bit more about results. Um, so these are the characteristics that they compared between the two groups. There are some statistical differences, um, especially comorbidity, which is um, relevant because it shows um, that the um, complete clinical response um, patients that um, were found at a later reassessment, um, so they had um, a high amount of comorbidity present um, in the patient sets um, and also um, the baseline T and baseline N. Um, with this it's not necessarily applicable to the UK and Europe because um, often with T1 and T2 um, and especially even T2 even with N1 disease it's operate, operative management um, is usually the first line and T2 um, N1 is sometimes considered um, operative management is considered first um, so, and that's kind of the UK and Europe um, baseline that they tend to go for so and there's quite a high amount of patients um, with T1 and T2 in the CCR at first reassessment um, and then it just shows um, that there's no difference in the induction therapy, but there is um, kind of a large amount um, of different therapies that patients in the study received. And so I'll just go on to um, the results and outcomes. So their primary outcome of organ preservation. Um, so they didn't see any difference in organ preservation, distant um, metastasis-free survival, or overall survival. Um, and their median follow-up was 2.6 years at first assessment and 2.9 at later assessment. Um, however, um, overall survival um, is probably the most reliable um, because it doesn't depend on um, how often these patients are followed up, whereas the other two do. And um, organ preservation, although it's slightly more reliable than disease than distant metastasis free survival, um, because Reoccurrent, local reoccurrence tends to happen within the first two years. Um, it's still not ideal because it does depend on kind of the um, how well um, it's um, picked up endoscopically and also how often patients are being followed up and then just a metastasis free survival. Um, and these can often happen up to five to 10 years later down the line. So some patients will be missed by this. 
Um, and I'll just go to the next slide. And so back to Gia. Wonderful. Um, so in the next um, uh, sort of three slides, we'll have a, just a quick look at how this uh, author subclassify the uh, near a complete clinical response based on MRI data, endoscopy data on both modalities data. So whichever one of them picked up that the response was not complete. And as you can see, there is uh, sort of slightly worse outcomes for people that have a near complete clinical response on both modalities, so both MRI uh, and endoscopy and slightly better uh, for the other two groups. Um, that does not necessarily translate in terms of this metastasis free survival or overall survival. Um, so um, it, this subgroup analysis is rather inconclusive, if you like. And as you can see, if you then look at the actual numbers, especially if you start hitting four or five years, the population at risk that remains in the study becomes fairly small on pretty much all three um, outcomes measured. Um, so Bo, back to Sean for some more limitations. So the self-reported limitations of the paper um, were patients um, who had a near complete clinical response, but who never quite achieved it, just um, could not be included, which could be quite a large um, data set, which would be a good comparison that just weren't included in the paper. And um, it did not include patients with near CR who were referred for surgery um, and for an in initial kind of um, when they first noticed it and just were referred immediately to surgery um, and did not achieve a complete clinical response. Uh, we <laughs> picked up a few other things um, as we were going through the paper. Well, obviously, this is a, a data set study that starts from 1991 and carries on to 2020. Um, two. Um, so there obviously is a degree of selection bias. Um, patients are included uh, in the data set based on different criteria that has, have evolved over um, a, a period of over 20, uh, over, over 30 years, actually. Um, I believe the reason issue is stage migration bias, um, because certainly, um, particularly MRI technology, but also MRI reporting checklists, as well as endoscopy technology have changed um, during the period of the study. So I can't imagine the accuracy of those staging investigations, particularly nodal assessment, um, would be uh, equally accurate across the study population. There would be some differences. Um, it is nearly impossible to figure out what type of neoadjuvant treatment these patients had. The paper doesn't mention it. The data set probably doesn't collect data to that level of granularity. Uh, so we are unable to really say what worked best or if there was an actual difference. So if, if patients had any additional treatment after their uh, first uh, reassessment. Um, as Sean mentioned, um, I'm not entirely sure what the indication is for um, um, treatment, the adjuvant treatment in uh, T1 and T2s. Um, a bit hard to say whether these patients were uh, sort of included here in um, as part of experimental studies in, in early stages of the development of new adjuvant treatment for rectal cancer. Um, another very important point that relates to sort of the time span of this study is that transanal salvage availability um, certainly wasn't there in the 90s and certainly has found its introduction in routine clinical practice only with time and certainly has become more and more available in the past few years. So um, not every patient um, was offered that possibility or had that um, sort of procedure as a potential additional treatment when uh, um, after having the neoadjuvant treatment. Um, we did discuss what the most reliable outcome here, and I think it's reasonably evident from what Sean mentioned, that we do think that overall survival would be in the context of um, a study that does have no clear-cut protocol on follow-up or clear-cut follow-up investigations or a timeline for those investigations would be probably the most reliable one, um, overall survival. Um, I had a quick look at the data set um, validation and the data set sort of um, layout. I couldn't really find much out there. The authors don't really talk about it. So I'm not sure how well validated the study is. It's worth mentioning that 
the data set started in 2014 and data before 2014 was inputted retrospectively uh, in uh, um, the data set. And I'll give you that only a margin of fraction, well, a margin of fraction, about 100 patients um, who were included retrospectively before 2014. Um, still a reasonable number. Right, and Sean, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, um, so um, our bottom line was that um, the outcomes between the two groups seemed comparable and there was no kind of significant difference between them. Um, however, the methodology and the clinical limitations of this paper make it very difficult to apply to current practice that we use in the UK and in Europe. Um, so um, the good points that we said were that we had a large sample size and it was a multi-centered data set and in clinical it was a relevant it's a hot topic that people are talking about um, and it um, the primary outcome choice was good and it did include kind of overall survival as well um, bad parts are it does have selection bias um, in terms of retrospective data and it was um, some of the data was inputted retrospectively um, so from 2014 back to 1991 um, and also the um, stage migration bias that Geo touched on as well. Um, and there is no morbidity data. So um, patients who had um, radiotherapy and um, so radiation proctitis, so there's nothing on that in this paper and also the inclusion of um, TAMIs as well. Thank you. Thank you. As usual, a quick summary of what we discussed after the paper presentation. Uh, on top of what we mentioned, uh, particularly in relationship to inclusion bias and stage migration bias, on a side note, if you're interested in this, uh, have a look on our YouTube channel. There's an episode on uh, uh, biases in observational studies. Uh, we discussed the fact that this particular study could be affected by mortal time bias. Uh, this is particularly evident when looking at the survival curves uh, that tend to have uh, a flattened appearance in the uh, sort of earliest part of, of the curve itself. Uh, immortal time bias happens when uh, patients that are included in a study uh, have a survival advantage over patients that are otherwise affected by the same condition, are treated in the same way, but due to their unfitness, uh, do not survive up to a point where they get included in the study. In this particular case, it would be that patients that are treated with uh, neoadjuvant treatment and due to their comorbidities or intolerance to treatment, don't survive to the point where they can be assessed the first time. And this could significantly affect the survival analysis. Uh, we also discussed how um, there is overall in this paper, we feel a lack of a meaningful denominator. Uh, patients are included uh, based on their end outcome, uh, aka the uh, achievement of a complete uh, clinical response at some point. It becomes then very difficult to take this data and use it to counsel patients when they are in the process of getting the adjuvant treatment and have not achieved a complete clinical response, uh, particularly when patients that have been deemed unsuitable for surgery have already been excluded from the study and patients. So this can further bias the result of the study. Uh, I'll leave you to Prof Sabah's presentation. ...trials before, and I think last month we talked about a couple of limitations of randomized controlled trials. In fact, I've got a slide here uh, that is a summary of the previous talk. And we talked about how some of the results of RCTs may not be generalizable, and uh, we talked about that with an example from a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, on the role of um, iodine uh, in low risk thyroid cancer. And we talked about how results of RCTs are not often in sync with results of observational studies or even database studies. And we talked about how with RCTs, um, there is a significant uh, obstacle in studying long-term outcomes and how sometimes short-term outcomes might favor one treatment while long-term outcomes may favor the other treatment. So those are the things we talked about uh, as, as some important limitations of RCTs. And, uh, and today I thought we should talk about uh, the so-called trial effects in RCTs. 
And I'll start off by giving you an example. And I might just give you one minute to um, write in the chat box what you could, uh, what you see as the potential reasons for uh, for a particular observation. I'll explain that in a second. So let's just imagine that you are either designing or you're conducting uh, a multicentered RCT uh, where you're comparing laparoscopic um, surgery versus robotic surgery for colorectal cancer. And you're really interested in um, disease specific survival and perhaps quality of life as well. And then you've done this uh, big study involving say multiple centers in the, in the United Kingdom. And, and uh, let's then see uh, the outcomes in patients who are taking part in the trial, regardless of whether they have the lap or the robotic surgery versus patients who for various reasons uh, are not in the trial. Either the patients didn't want to take part or the clinicians thought um, they're probably not suited for the trial or they just didn't meet the eligibility criteria. And uh, let's assume that the trial showed, as many trials do show, that, um, or your analysis showed that trial participants seem to do better than non-trial participants. So it's not to do um, with whether they had laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery, but just overall patients within trials uh, have done better than patients that are outside of trials. Now, uh, why, uh, why do you think um, this would be? What are the potential reasons why trial patients uh, are doing better than non-trial patients? Um, do you mind just putting whatever your thoughts are in the chat box and maybe Gio can summarize? Hawthorne effect, um, yeah. Uh, I'll come to, I'll explain the Hawthorne effect um, in a bit. And then people with motivation and, and uh, yeah, concerns about the health may have other attributes that uh, make them uh, uh, generally fitter, more tolerant of treatment and they're stronger and therefore these are the probably the patients who will be in trials yeah that's good any other reasons so they, they can be a number of different reasons and that's what we're going to talk about now so um what would help is um trying to categorize or box these reasons into two major categories Right. So the first um, category is what I would uh, refer to as the cohort effects. Um, yeah, this this were some more uh, reasons in the chat box. That's good. So uh, what do I mean by cohort effects? By cohort effects, I simply mean that there could be differences in, between the patients in the trials and patients uh, outside of trials, and that could be because of the eligibility criteria. Patients have to meet certain eligibility criteria before they can be uh, before they can take part in the trial. There could be uh, some factors that are not really documented, whereby the clinicians are a bit concerned about patients entering into this trial. Some patients, some clinicians might think that this patient is neither suitable for laparoscopy nor robotic, uh, and therefore might be unwilling to enter them into the trial or may not have. Um, broach the topic of trial participation. And sometimes patients for various reasons uh, might just not want to take part in the trial. They might be suspicious of getting involved in trials and so on and so forth. So you know these reasons. So these are all uh, reasons how non-trial participants can somehow be quite different to trial participants despite having you know, colorectal cancer and despite having various other similarities. So there could be differences between cohorts, yeah? The other um, set of uh, reasons are grouped under the category of trial effects. So um, under this category, there are four distinct um, points to consider. One is that for one reason or the other, the trial participants get better treatments or better care. The other reason is uh, what we refer to as the protocol effect. And I'll explain that in a second. Then comes the Hawthorne effect, which um, uh, one of you mentioned, and finally the placebo effect. So what we'll do in the next few slides is to go through each of these trial effects uh, in the context of the example we've just discussed. 
So the example is uh, a multicentered RCT comparing lap versus robotic surgery. So what, what about different treatments and differences in care? So it could be that patients in the trial um, uh, allocated to either robotic or laparoscopic surgery um, are likely to get their surgery from expert high volume surgeons. It could be that the trial itself stipulates that if you um, are getting into the trial and having robotic surgery, then the surgeon should have done 20 procedures or something like that. Or the surgeon should be a high volume surgeon doing more than 10 or 20 or 30 laparoscopic surgeries a year. And that may not necessarily be the case for non-trial participants. It could be that a trial patients had more frequent follow-ups as, as you mentioned before. And it could also be that trial patients have more contact with research staff, more uh, uh, often minor discrepancies in results are picked up while filling in the trial documentation. Uh, you know, uh, you're more likely to act upon these uh, minor issues that are picked up in the labs or on scans. And, and then uh, those um, factors might influence um, outcomes such as survival and quality of life. The next uh, kind of trial effect is the so-called protocol effect. Uh, as you probably already know, trial patients uh, are subject to a very well-defined set of instructions, or um, we call that the protocol. And this pro protocol could stipulate how surgery is done, sometimes steps of surgery, specific aspects of preoperative care and, uh, and postoperative care. And um, all of that dotting the I's and crossing the T's um, in terms of following the protocol um, will potentially favor the participants in the trial. Sometimes trial protocol mandates extensive screening for sepsis and other risk factors for perioperative morbidity that you may not necessarily do in the average non-trial patient. And the protocol often mandates um, quite rigidly when adjuvant treatment has to be uh, initiated, when patients have to be followed up. And this is not often the case in our bog standard NHS patient where logistics and resource, resource constraints uh, can um, often influence when the patient gets their adjuvant treatment, unfortunately. So these are all uh, referred to as the protocol effect. The next effect is what you've uh, you mentioned, one of you mentioned the Hawthorne effect. So I'll give a bit of a background. So uh, essentially the Hawthorne effect refers to the phenomenon or the impact of the awareness of being observed on the behavior of either the, the trial participants or the treatment or care providers like the surgeons. So it was first described by a chap called Landsberger in the US who looked at data um, from a number of studies done on a uh, factory in Chicago, the Hawthorne Works, in the 1920s and 1930s. And what they did is they evaluated the impact of different interventions on the output of, the, of their workers. And the interventions would be things like giving them breaks, five minute or 10 minute breaks, giving them snacks or food at breaks, shortening the work days, changing the illumination of the factory, and so on and so forth. And the interesting thing is that regardless of the nature of the intervention, or the direction of the intervention, output would increase in the factory. And this has been attributed to changes in the behavior of the workers as a result of their knowledge that they're being observed and their output is, and their, um, their production, uh, the produce is being counted. So there's been a lot of debate on the design of these studies and uh, how the data has been interpreted and several other factors other than this impact on behavior has been postulated. But, however, um, this is a really important effect and has got significant parallels in medical literature. So coming back to um, uh, medical literature then, um, interestingly, there's been a study on uh, and the Hawthorne effect, a direct assessment of the Hawthorne effect, not in surgical literature, I have to say, but in uh, neuropsychiatric literature, whereby what they did was um, they got hold of a, a big group of patients with dementia and they randomized the patients to a herbal product called ginkgo biloba. It's a basically a supplement from um, a, a plant species uh, that is native in China. Um, and they gave and they randomized patients to either receiving this herbal supplement or placebo. And they also randomized 
in a two by two factorial design, and the same group of patients to either receiving intensive follow up or minimal follow up. And they, at the end of the study, they looked at cognition. And the interesting thing is that the herbal supplement did not affect cognition, but the cognition was improved in the group of patients who had intensive follow up. And by intensive follow up, basically meant more frequent assessments and, uh, of the patients. And the authors argued that this is evidence of the Hawthorne effect in that the participants knew they were being observed more closely and being monitored, and they're doing the best to um, put up, you know, and come up with a better sort of uh, cognitive performance. Right. So back to our example, laparoscopic versus robotic surgery for colorectal cancer. So how could the Hawthorne effect be applicable here? Now, surgeons, if they are being aware of the scrutiny associated with uh, the trial, it is possible that the um, expert surgeons or the senior surgeons did most of the operation and didn't uh, allow or give much of the operating to the trainees. It is possible that they paid more attention to every step in the operation, consciously or subconsciously. And it's not just the surgeons, but also the anesthetists, the physiotherapists, the intensivists um, may have potentially provided, um, you know, um, provided more attention and followed the various aspects of perioperative care a bit more rigidly because they know that all of the outcomes and the interventions are being documented and scrutinized as part of the trial. So, um, so you can see how the Hawthorne effect can play a significant role um, not in biasing uh, and causing differences between um, the lap and robotic arm, but just um, increasing the chance of a better outcome in patients taking part in the trials overall, regardless of the arm to which they have been randomized to. Uh, the next, uh, the final effect, uh, the trial effect is the so-called placebo effect. I'm sure you all heard of the placebo effect, which essentially um, refers to uh, the phenomenon that patients do well um, because they perceive that they're getting new treatment, a novel intervention. They've been looked after more. They've been followed up very carefully. They've got the contact of the clinical uh, no specialists in the research nurses. So um, regardless of whether they're getting a laparoscopic or robotic arm, um, they might feel that uh, they're getting a specialist or additional treatment. Now, um, there's not much in the uh, surgical literature with regards to, the, uh, to empiric data on trial effects in surgical trials, uh, but it is a good uh, um, a study in the medical literature, um, and then I've provided the link there, um, where they looked at patients, uh, HIV positive patients who participated in trials of highly active antiretroviral viral therapy and compared these patients to patients with HIV who did not take part in the HAART uh, trials, but received routine clinical care, which would have included uh, these antiretroviral agents. And they found really good evidence and that there was uh, a difference in the viral load in that patients within trials did better and had a much reduced viral load compared to patients outside of trials, regardless of what treatment they received. Right, I wanted to conclude by just mentioning the halo effect. The halo effect is different to the trial effects we've discussed uh, so far. Um, I was um, uh, also under the false impression that the halo effect is also a kind of trial effect, and that is not the case. Essentially, it's a phenomenon whereby uh, you have a single trait and you take that as being reflective of other attributes uh, in a particular patient or person or thing. Now, a classic example would be uh, you know, a smartly dressed person uh, at an interview being perceived somehow to be better at his or her job based on their presentation and appearance. Uh, whereas we all know that that's not necessarily the case. And so how does that um, have an influence on surgical research? So in relation to surgical research, one of the things um, that may 
impact on your perception of how good a study is, is the journal's impact factor. Like the um, article we've discussed today, um, the paper is published in the British Journal of Surgery, it's got a very high impact factor. So even before you read the paper, you may um, attribute uh, a high level of importance to the paper, simply because it got published in the British Journal of Surgery. Um, typically, if you see a randomized control trial in the Annals of Surgery, which has, a, which has a very high impact factor, you're probably going to pay a lot more attention to it than if you come across a RCT in the Annals of Royal College of Surgeons of England. And I wouldn't blame you for that. But you've got to keep uh, in mind that there is a bias there. And um, um, there's been an interesting study in, uh, in, in sepsis, in sepsis literature, where authors essentially evaluated a number of factors that influence subsequent citations. And they found that journal impact factor, not the study design, or not another sort of um, measure of quality, but it was a journal impact factor that was an independent predictor of subsequent citations of those individual studies, which goes to show that uh, there's clear evidence that um, uh, there is halo effect and that journal impact factor does significantly influence more than study design, uh, does significantly influence what readers think of um, an individual study. And th that's a paper there, a link to the paper if you're interested. Right, so I'll summarize. Um, so uh, essentially, you've got to keep in mind that there's uh, a lot of evidence out there that just participating in the clinical trials, regardless of which arm you get into, the, the placebo arm or the standard arm or the intervention arm, um, on average, patients seem to do better in many scenarios, not in all scenarios, but many scenarios, they seem to be doing better than non-trial participants. And this could be due to a variety of reasons. It could be very simply that these are very different patients. So that's what we refer to as the cohort effects, but it could also be due to uh, the so-called trial effects, which as we have uh, just discussed, uh, you can summarize as uh, the effects of different treatments or care, and the effects of following a rigid protocol, uh, the Hawthorne effect, the fact that people are being observed, and the placebo effect. Patients uh, thinking that they are in the trial and probably therefore everything is being done as per a probably a higher standard. And finally, remember the halo effect uh, when you're coming across papers and when you're looking at what journal the paper got published in. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.